it's very fair to say that most of the people who are farming these points, you know, don't care about intersubjective forking. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if the market has caught up with what these terms mean. Certainly not that one. Welcome to the Protocol Podcast. I'm Brad Cowan here with my co-hosts, Margot Nykirk and Sam Kessler. So excited to dive into today's show with the latest news and developments in technology behind crypto and blockchains. First, please do not forget to subscribe to our weekly newsletter, The Protocol, on Coindesk.com. Let's dive right into it. Today, uh, the three of us are going to be discussing a few of the hot protocol related stories from the past week and a couple just this week and there's a couple pretty big stories we're going to get to the eigenlayer eigen token white paper after the break and first we're going to go to margo here margo this story that we've been following for months and we're we've been a little bit obsessed with it i have to admit Strangely, it is not the hugest story, but it's more it has some symbolic significance, which I think is is pretty interesting. And it's the story is Cello chooses optimism, concluding bake off among layer twos. That was our headline. Uh, Margo, why don't you tell us about this story? Symbolic is kind of the perfect way to talk about this because this has been going on for months. This has really brought out the rivalry among the layer two teams when it comes to like, um, to showcasing their technology and trying to grab new users and new projects. And, you know, this all started because Celo, uh, you know, a layer one blockchain announced that it wants to become a layer two and move to the Ethereum ecosystem. And it was looking for what stack to go on. And originally actually it said, okay, we were going to choose OP stack. Um, because as many other projects have chosen OP stack, it's easy to spin up. It was one of the first ones out there. Um, and then, you know, time went on and more and more teams started to pitch their own projects. Polygon threw its hat in the ring. Um, ZK Sync at some point did as well. Uh, I think Arbitrum did too. Um, and so this really became like a competition, um, for one specific blockchain. Um, and this was probably one of the most public ones because this was all happening on their public forum. Um, and then here we are eight months later, nine months later, I think, and right back to where they started. They are they have decided that they're going to go ahead with OP stack and build on the OP stack. So yeah, that concluded sort of the uh, big competition. It still has to be approved by their community. They have to vote on it, but it's likely going to move forward um, and the vote will succeed. You know what I loved about this story, Margo, is that it was not a PR job. There's so many of these announcements that are geared toward, okay, we came out with a new thing or, hey, we won this new project and you don't see kind of the sausage being made. Mm -hmm. And here, this was somewhat organic. I feel like the way it kind of, it just grew. At, at first, Cello was just, they were just going to go with OP, right? And then, but they do have this open governance process. And so they kind of put it out there for a community vote. And then they got all this in, interest from these developers and they were making public announcements. So it kind of, the story kind of got away from them and they were <laughs> suddenly the bell of the ball for probably a horrible analogy. But then, it became a very public process that we were just all kind of gawking at. Uh, I don't know. What do you think about that? Yeah, definitely. I mean, I think, you know, with these other, other projects, we're sort of told, you know, when we, when, when we sit down with these teams and ask like, why did you choose a certain stack? You know, what, what was the process like? They always give some kind of vague answer about all of this. Um, but here in this case, you know, you could very publicly see in their, in their governance forums, like the different leaders of these different teams, like, you know, 
wanting, making their case for why they want to join. And on top of that, you know, I think I, I thought it was interesting because I, I asked the Cello folks, um, I asked Renee, uh, the co-founder of the of the Cello Foundation, you know, why at the beginning choose OP Stack, go through this like eight month, nine month long process, and then end up right where you began. That sort of seems like a waste of time. And his argument was like, actually, you know, we we this we feel even more confident now in our selection because we've had the time now to play around with these different technologies and see how our ecosystem fits well, you know, in terms of transferring certain, you know, technological capabilities onto a layer two. Um, and so they've really played around with these different stacks and have sort of evaluated and they and sort of gave them more confidence going in like, you know what, we like I we really trusted our judgment in the beginning where I really trust my judgment now with OP stack for this ecosystem. Um, so that was re- that was really interesting. That was a that was a surprising takeaway that, that I, uh, you know, heard from the from the cello folks. Yeah, I think that was they they were pretty in the end when they made their decision, they were somewhat merciful, I think, to the losers kind of the way they they spun it. They made it clear that this is this we're not saying that OP is the best team. They were just saying it, they just kind of said it's right it was the best decision for us. I feel yeah, like Yeah, kinda... and they also, you know, they also mentioned, you know, Polygon since then has come out with their type 1 prover where they're hoping to connect different ecosystems to the Polygon ecosystem. Um and Solo had mentioned that, you know, we're going to go ahead with OP stack, but you know, we can still connect to for instance the Polygon type 1 prover. So, um that was a pretty clear signal that, you know, that they're that they have looked at other technologies and sort of evaluated what works for them um, and how they can sort of adapt using these new, um, you know, new innovations. And yet it is super competitive among all these teams, right? Margo. Uh, and and there was this other story that we were just going to mention real quick about the vulnerabilities on optimism uh margo why don't you just kind of tell us what happened there and why that's kind of amusing to 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 watch right so we're bringing this up sort of under the framework of like the rivalry between the the different teams right so um on over the weekend off chain labs which is the primary developer of arbitrum had found two critical vulnerabilities on their test net related to their fraud proofs um and for those who don't know fraud proofs are pretty central to optimistic rollups and how they function um and op i believe had them and then got rid of them and then now they're bringing them back um and that's sort of been like the the uh, main criticism for for their technology, and especially you know, as we we're sitting here talking about OP Stack, um, and prior to this, you know, Base had tapped OP Stack, World Chain, Sam wrote about that has tapped OP Stack. All these different um, you know major projects are going to be building with Optimism technology, and for the longest time, they didn't have the central component to using an optimistic rollup, um, and so now they're bringing it back. It's in Testnet. Um, and off-chain labs had found some critical vulnerabilities and had gone on a little bit of a social media blitz um, to show, you know, where we, you know, we found these issues um, on our competitor. And just like, you know, to back up a little bit, it's actually very normal for competitive teams to test out their competitors' technologies. That's sort of how they improve their own um, capabilities. Um, so it's not anything out of the the ordinary to, you know, for off-chain lab developers to sort of play around with optimism technology. Um, but in the context of all of this, it was interesting because Arbitrum is, you know, the leading layer one in terms of TBL. Optimism sort of has the more the bigger brand recognition. Um, and so this very public uh display of here's what's wrong with your technology sort of fed into this ongoing rivalry between the layer two teams in a very public way. Um, so, you know, these layer two wars, which Cello was just part of, you know, this is another chapter as part of it. We've seen in the past Polygon and ZK Sinks, like, you know, get at each other. Uh, this is just like another chapter in this ongoing, um, uh, Ongoing com- conversation or, or yeah, rivalry is the word I keep going back to because that's really how, what 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 it is. We have the the Kentucky Derby for the horse race is coming up, and often the the focus is just on kind of the the real contenders here. And I feel like these teams they really are. I mean, we can't. We're talking about 
these teams are the real contenders at this point, the front runners for kind of dominance of, of what the future landscape of smart contract blockchain ecosystem is going to look like. And, And so it is really interesting to kind of watch these, these incremental skirmish face-offs between these teams. Um, any anything real quick before we move on, Sam? Yeah, I, I was just gonna mention, like, uh, kind of going off this whole controversy we saw over the weekend with the fault proofs not being ready. Fraud proofs, fault proofs—they call it kind of different things depending on who you ask. But you know, the name keeps changing on Optimism side. But it is a pretty striking thing that those don't exist. And when you talk to teams that are going to deploy on um, OP stack. Oftentimes, what they'll tell you is that they're waiting for those proofs to exist before they actually introduce the technology. So when I talked to WorldCoin, um, Tools for Humanity, the development firm behind WorldCoin, I was just reminded because you mentioned them moving over there. They, they mentioned before this bug was found that they were going to wait until these proofs existed um, to, to launch the, the full version of their chain. So the idea that these things don't exist yet, again, is pretty stunning because it is the core of how the technology works. There's a lot that's been written about that that I encourage people to look up. But, you know, um, I I wonder if this race kind of changes as people realize that the tech isn't there quite yet. And then one other thing I'll say really briefly is that Optimism does seem to have the, the community, which might be why they've managed to win so many of these teams. But Arbitrum remains larger, I, I, I believe, in terms of TVL. Yeah, no, I think those are really great points. I mean, you know, you 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 just need to log on to Twitter and and or X, and um, everyone will go on about how stunning it is that fall proofs, fog proofs, like you know, is not on optimism. I will add, like, I agree with the with the with the governance or the community kind of aspect that optimism has. You know, base. But I, I keep turning back to base in this example with OP stock because it's like sort of the big first example when it came to this. I think what will be interesting to see with these projects moving forward um, is something like a similar setup to what base and the, the base and um, optimism, like op- optimism collective agreement, where they came out with these principles about like, contributing to the OP collective, which is this you know, group of people or everyone that sort of falls under the optimism ecosystem, including these builders and users. Um, But, you know, it was an exchange also sort of for, I think it was like 117 million. I need to sort of check the numbers again, but I think it was 117, 118 million tokens, OP tokens. So, um, you know, I asked the Cello folks, is there anything sort of similar here going on? They wouldn't, they, they said no, but um, but that they would be able to tap into some of the grants that, um, that optimism is sort of uh, giving out, uh, which includes distributing op tokens um so that is sort of thing something to keep an eye on with everyone building on op stack like what does it mean in terms of op delegate token delegation um so that's you know that could be you know if we're if we're if we're talking here about essential component of uh, the technology that makes an optimistic roll up an optimistic roll up is missing yet everyone is building on this technology um you know where what are sort of the other draws to this technology um and so it'll be interesting to see what that means in terms of uh, how they contribute to the op collective and and um and token allocations well yeah i we talked this was the whole subject of of our podcast a couple of weeks ago with Casey Mortimer and runes it's all about being able to gin up new fungible tokens and these projects, they come out with, they, they have the money printer and they use it. And then that is what's used to, to fund their ecosystem growth. And it's one of the most fascinating things because it's not really regulated, even though there might want to be regulation. And this, <laughs> this is what Wall Street's bread and butter was to raise money, capital raising. And now these projects just, Launch a token, and, and that's what we're going to talk about after the break, uh, which is Renzo. They had their, we're talking on Tuesday here, Renzo, they had their token launch today. It's a big liquid staking protocol that's been super controversial. And then uh, an Eigenlayer, which announced their token plan. So, And Sam has been digging into this story, so he's going to give us his hot take uh, right after we come back. Calling all developers. Score a consensus 2024 developer pass for just $109, but act fast. Only a limited number of these passes are available. You may have heard that consensus ain't for devs, but here's why you're wrong. 
Consensus is the only place you can fully immerse yourself in a multi-chain environment and learn directly from 20 plus chains, including Arbitrum, Chainlink, Solana, and more. Enjoy three days of intensive learning with technical talks, 40 plus expert speakers, and 20 plus in-depth workshops, including dedicated half days for Ethereum and Bitcoin, and three full days of programming on our Protocol Village stage. Consensus 2024 is happening May 29th through 31st in Austin, Texas. Don't miss your chance to network at curated developer meetups, find new career opportunities, and explore hundreds of side events and hacker houses around town. Grab your $109 developer pass today, but remember, this exclusive offer is limited. Visit consensus.coindesk.com now to secure your developer pass before they're gone. Explore the epicenter of blockchain innovation at Consensus 2024. And we're back. And we're going to talk about Eigenlayer's big announcement yesterday, which we've talked about Eigenlayer quite a bit on this podcast. We had Sri Ram Khanna and the project leader on uh, probably about a month ago. And Sam did that big story about how they sort of went live on mainnet and weren't really even ready. And now they're sort of coming out with their big token white paper and everybody's scrambling to figure it out. And there's a lot of questions. Uh, Sam, why don't you maybe just start at the top with some yeah. of the with the facts, and then we can kind of try to move into what the what the hot take is there. Okay. Um, well, I, I think it is fair to say, um, as a fact, that it has been a mess um, <laughs> on both the Renzo and the Eigenlayer front in terms of how these airdrops were facilitated and the community response, which we'll talk about later. Um, I'll just kind of mention on both fronts, like kind of what happened um, and what has kind of like invited the most scrutiny. Um, so on the Renzo end, this is a restaking protocol or a liquid restaking protocol that kind of deposits user money into Eigenlayer, that restaking protocol that we've talked about a bunch on this podcast. Won't get into all of that here, but essentially you can stake with them. They put it into Eigenlayer and they give you a derivative token in exchange. Um, and the way that all these platforms worked Eigenlayer on up, um, Eigenlayer, Renzo, EtherFi, so on and so forth. This whole kind of community, um, cottage industry of restaking startups has used points. And so people farmed a bunch of these points, which are just score counts that belong to each of the projects. We've talked about this on the podcast too. And the idea was that these points would eventually entitle people to some, you know, unknown amount of, of tokens. Now, the reason why this works is regulatory and we can get into that, but Essentially, uh, they can't actually, or they, they, they don't, they being the teams, never confirm that a token is coming. They just give you these points and let you kind of make your mind up on what they are. And so people put tens of billions of dollars, I think Eigenlayer is up to $16 billion. And the overall summary here is that in both the Renzo case and the Eigenlayer case, users feel like they have not been entitled to the number of tokens. Um, or the kinds of tokens that they would have wanted under the kind of vesting schedule um, based on the points that they farmed, based on the amount of deposits that they put in with the expectation of tokens. I said I was going to break it down, but at a high level, that, that, that's, that's what's, what's, what's going on. Um, th does that give us and enough well, just, to talk about, on, or should we get Renzo, into the specifics? Well, I mean, on Renzo specifically, Omkar... Yeah. Uh, Gobale, our co our colleague, wrote about this last week, and basically, they came out with their plan last week, right? Yeah. The, the thing happened today, but the plan was released last week, and people were so angry about it that the thing depegged from Ether. Oh, it's it's ridiculous. So what happened on um like in terms of you know how how this has all been you know handled and the, the, the outcry that you've seen on, on, on crypto Twitter, on crypto X, what happened on Renzo, and these are two distinct cases, Renzo and Eigenlayer, which came later. On Renzo, several things happened that, that got people angry, and we'll start there. The first thing is that they um, 
only allotted 5% of tokens to the community and some, you know, o- over 50%, I believe it was like 60 some percent, but don't quote me on that, um, were allotted to um, investors and um, the team itself. And to add insult to injury, when they released a chart on their website showing how many tokens had gone to different, you know, places, they put, you know, two buckets of 2.5% that like, you know, filled up like 20% of the of this pie chart. Basically, they made a pie chart that made it look like the community um, and ecosystem, quote unquote, were getting a much larger allotment than they actually, it, it, it was, oh my God, it, it almost feels like it must have been, it, it was ridiculous. It was, it, 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 it's comical. <laughs> totally. um, it, it looked like they were just like trying to sneak one by, but you know, 2.5% does not make up 10% of a graph. It's just, that's just not how it works. So people were really angry. They, you know, let their anger be known on Twitter and then on Discord. And Renzo actually, you know, f- first started delaying responses on its discord and then shut down the discord um entirely essentially as of today which is when claims opened up all the gal cry started last week when they announced the plan and there's been a big deep pegging which is when the ether asset has kind of become more valuable than the renzo version of ether that derivative token that we talked about before all that matters there is that a bunch of people who poured points into this thing and then used this renzo derivative in order to farm more points and farm more money um, just through De- DeFi protocols, that depegging meant that a bunch of people were liquidated because they cr- opened up positions thinking that Renzo would be worth this certain thing. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll stop. Uh, there's there's, no, there's even great. more to I, say I, about is, how they explained things, but but yeah. I think that gets right to your point about the system and this that it's the system in many ways is built upon expectations that are not yes. remotely codified in any specific yes. way. It's all just, but if you're in it, people do actually have very specific expectations. And that's the risk, right? right. That's the point stuff we've talked about in this podcast before, where they're transparently giving you points. They're saying, Hey, we don't know what these points are going to be tied to. Neither do you um, just, you know, we're, we're just telling you how much you've invested and, you know, maybe they'll be worth something. I don't know. Like, they won't even say that. Um, we, we grilled Mike from EtherFi on this um, before. Um, right. EtherFi, another one of these liquid restaking protocols. And they eventually did airdrop a token, even though on our podcast, he was kind of like, ooh, like, I don't know if we're going to launch a token based on these points. But Eigenlayer, I think that expectation things that you say, it, it ties to that. Um, I don't know if we want to get into that yet. Um, Let's get into it. I mean, Mar- the one thing I was thinking about, Margo, was uh, there's always complaints about these things. And we mm-hmm. saw it with Starkware, right? With their Stark token. And, and remember yeah. how many questions uh, Ellie Ben Sassan, I, I, he had to answer a million questions. He's this sort of cryptography expert, and he's sort of in a position of defending the decisions of who gets what on the Stark airdrop. Yeah, no, I mean, I was gonna, I was gonna bring that up as well. I mean, at this point, it just feels like every airdrop, I mean, I don't know to what extent, um, you know, Lorenzo's case is a little bit, it's a a little bit more easier to digest, but, but StarkNet was also quite a complicated, um, airdrop and a lot of people were very angry with it and you know same with eigenlayer i think also a lot of this question goes around like how much are investors how much are early contributors getting in proportion to the rest of the community the actual users um and that sort of also gets out of a little bit of what's going on on eigenlayer um so you know messy angry airdrops just seem to be um part of the game (laughs) at this point yeah um yeah yeah that's really so, I mean, well said, <clears throat> Margo. Well said. What, what happened on Eigenlayer was a little bit different than Renzo, where they've not been accused of miscommunicating things, shutting down their discords, and, and so on and so forth. The, the thing that happened on Eigenlayer is, like you said, Brad, people had expectations. They thought that this would be the biggest airdrop of all time. Um, and that they would, you know, they being investors would be entitled to, you know, uh, um, a bunch of, you know, uh, new tokens as a result of how many points they've accrued and those expectations were shattered once the plan was explained to people yesterday in a white paper so the key things that people took issue with were first off um there's going to be pretty strict vpn blocking so people um, well first off people are not going to be able to claim the airdrop if they're in the united states that's par for the course that's a regulatory thing 
there's a lot of reasons why that, you know, we, we, I, I want to yeah. talk about that maybe if not today. No, it's a great time, story, but, but you're right. It's, it's yeah. beyond the scope of what every we time we right talk now. about an airdrop, you can't claim it in the United States, but people work around that with VPMs. Eigenlayer has instituted additional things to make that much harder, much harder to claim if you're in the United States. And people are like, you're based in the United States, talking to Eigen Labs, the, the team behind this. The investors mm -hmm. are based in the United States that are getting the tokens. So people were really upset about that. Expectations broken. Another thing that they were upset about is there's these weird lockup periods. So you're not actually until for you're not actually going to be able to transfer your tokens. So tokens are going to start vesting for investors. They usually have like a cliff. There's an amount of time in which investors are not able, able to spend their tokens and can accrue tokens. Um, but investors are going to start vesting, even though they can't transfer their tokens, wh while normal users also still can't transfer their tokens. And so there's like an unknown period of time where nobody's going to be able to transfer tokens. Investors are being allotted tokens and users just can't, you know, cash out on their positions. And some people, you know, it just totally changes the time horizon that people were thinking about. Um, and again, these were based on assumptions um, and not, you know, yeah. anything concrete from Eigenlayer who didn't even say that a token was coming. And there's a bunch yeah. more examples that kind of are in this vein that have really upset people who had expectations around these points. Um, and let's a, just the system's insane. Yeah. Let's just talk about, and I, I, I know we're just starting to report on this ourselves and try to figure it all out. They dumped this big white paper yesterday, but they have this whole system around what they're calling intersubjective forking which is just yeah. such uh, uh so many syllables yeah <laughs> for <laughs> but and but a uh, lot of that seems to be oriented toward addressing some of the concerns that vitalik buterin has laid out which is that this the eigenlayer is somehow going to nuke all of ethereum yeah. at some point but with all the risk uh but i what have you what have you come to on that so far sam in your reporting yeah i mean so the idea behind eigenlayer is that you can take eth that you've staked to secure ethereum and then you can stake that eth on eigenlayer to secure a bunch of other protocols the idea being that instead of a bunch of protocols, each being like Sri and Son on our podcast, the head of Eigenlayer, instead of 100 protocols being secured by a billion dollars, you have 100 protocols each pooling their billion dollars and having 100 billion dollars securing them. And the idea being that in a proof of stake system like Ethereum or these actively validated services on Eigenlayer, the amount of stake that there is, the amount of people who have put up money to defend it, that's the amount of money that it would take for an attacker to come in and take the money. So if you've got 100 people or 100 different protocols secured by $100 billion, an attacker would need $100 billion now to take money from any one of those protocols. That's a, a, a dumbed down version when I say take money, but to attack. So the idea of why this might be risky is because the whole thing that you know, keeps this system afloat is the idea of slashing. None of this exists yet, by the way. Um, but the idea of slashing, where a validator who has participated in this system, who has staked money, gets penalized, they get some of their stake revoked if they try to lie. That's the whole way that this whole thing stays safe. But if somebody lies or if um, somebody lies about somebody lying and then some of this pool starts disappearing, the details get kind of um, complicated. But the idea is that Ethereum, the social consensus, meaning the group of people that you know, are you know, stakeholders in the Ethereum ecosystem might decide, oh my God, like Eigenlayer is blowing up. I'd rather just restart, not just Eigenlayer, but Ethereum, like let's start a whole new Ethereum chain because the economics have gotten so screwed up over on Ethereum as a result of what happened on Eigenlayer. And they've released this thing called, I, and I think it's purposefully convoluted. I, I've decided like 44 pages on this. I think Eigenlayer's thing, like they want to make it convoluted, but interest objective staking is their whole gambit to kind of separate Ethereum social consensus from Eigenlayer social consensus. So if Eigenlayer blows up, it can't, or a product on Eigenlayer blows up, an AVS, an actively validated service, it doesn't blow up Ethereum. People can use this token and fork this token and create new instances of these apps on Eigenlayer to kind of accommodate the blow up. Um, I, I, I don't this know if I made that more complicated. This is all theoretical, right? But, it's all but so it's, theoretical. <laughs> but it's yeah. all, but it is, it, uh, Margo, you, the history goes back to kind of the DAO hack. Is that, with the where they they did the fork to try to reverse what had happened right and that's that's sort of in the back of everybody's minds here 
Oh, for sure. I think so. And I think, you know, and I think also, you know, I'm sure Vitalik and Shriam have spoken at some point, you know, it's not like they don't have any interactions and Vitalik, like you mentioned, Vitalik has been very public about what this would mean for, you know, the consensus, like the Ethereum consensus. Yeah. And so, um, you know, maybe I can't speak for, for the Eigenlayer folks. I can't speak for Shriram, but Part of me feels like, you know, they did not expect this to be as big as what it is right now. And so this is, this is, as this gets bigger, this becomes more and more of a concern. And so maybe this is, again, this is all just me digesting what has happened over the last 24 hours, but this could be a way of just sort of mitigating and understanding, you know, as Eigenlayer is, I think I read somewhere Eigenlayer is actually the second biggest DeFi protocol like out there. Um, yeah. But, yeah. Um, you know, there's, there's, there, yeah. yeah. So, um, so yeah, there, you know, I'm, I'm sure Shreebrim has not gone around, you know, the, the industry without hearing these concerns over and over and over again, especially from the people who were there in 2016. Um, so, yeah. There's podcasts too where you can hear Shriram debating Vitalik. I think it was Bankless had one a while back yeah. um, to promote another podcast, I guess, on our podcast. Uh, but it, it is honestly worth listening to that. Um, they they brought a different host in and kind of just go back and forth. And this was over a year ago, I believe, or several months ago at least, where Vitalik kind of you know sparred a little bit with Shriram about Shriram, the head of Eigenlayer, about those two, you know, these you know dueling um, uh, the idea that this could all blow up Ethereum. But uh, one one thing I'll add here too is there is that regulatory angle, um, and the reason why all this exists. And like I don't want to just you know I I, I don't want to just uh, harp too much on Eigenlayer screwing up. They're trying to be conservative, and regulations are not clear in the United States around crypto and yeah. how tokens should be launched. And um, there was the ICO boom in 2017. Now we have these points, the idea of making adding a little bit more transparency, but opening up a bunch of other problems. We didn't even mention that there's a lot of people who aren't going to be entitled to tokens. That was like a huge part of the blow up is people who had rehypothecated their points on other platforms are, we don't know when they're going to get, you know, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one pairing in terms of points to, to, to airdrop. But anyway, um, the whole reason this exists, they will tell you, is because of the unclear regulatory framework in the United States that has forced this weird norm of like labs, foundations, you know, yeah. uh, 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 you know, whatever, issuing authorities and Cayman Islands, you know, um, stuff going on all over the world. It's just, it's a mess. Um, and Eigenlayer might just be trying to be conservative, um, which is different from the Renzo thing where they've been really kind of attacked for um you know charts that are insane um uh yeah. we should probably wrap it up pretty soon one thing i was just thinking about was casey rodemar's perspective and i think it's kind of hard to push back against his perspective that it's all just a giant game really mm -hmm. it, it, especially with the dgens and the points farming and they're try they want to make money but it's really just a game and it, but it's at the same time the world's most complicated game and you have to understand all these angles and understand the technology and understand how blockchains work and understand how to do specific things with the wallet and and defi and and uh and then you have these teams people who are serious brainiacs building this stuff and they're forced to engage in these games. And it's pretty, it's pretty amusing to watch. Uh, and it's just, it's just kind of where we are in this industry right now. I don't know that, that it might be one perspective. What do y'all, do you have any quick thoughts on that, Margo? Yeah. I mean, I also think, you know, Sam was kind of getting at this, that, you know, things are made out to seem also more complicated than they actually are. I mean, the Eigen token, like, you know, he was saying 43 pages of the Eigen token white paper. The Eigen layer white paper, I think, is 17 pages. Okay. Like, like, a lot of these things are made out. I mean, it is complicated. Don't get me wrong. But a lot of this is also jargon and added on top of it to make it seem like it's even more innovative than it actually is. So it's, it's, that's part of that game too. And, but yeah, I, I agree. And at the very least, you got to imagine that 
Most of the people investing in this stuff aren't reading that white paper. Most of the people who are farming for item layer aren't reading that white paper. Whether or not there's anything real behind it, which there's, you know, I I don't want to, um, you know, slander um, Eigenlayer. I do think there's a lot of people, very smart people working on that project, even if they, you know, write in a way that's super opaque. Um, I I do think that mo- it's very fair to say that most of the people who are farming these points, you know, don't care about intersubjective forking. Um, no. So, uh, yeah, I don't know if the market has caught up with what these terms mean. Anyway, um, certainly not that one. Oh. Okay, well, uh, this has been a pretty fun discussion, I have to confess. Uh, we've had some good good stories to talk about here, and Sam's continuing to dig into that one, and Margo following it as well. And So there's never a dull day in crypto. And uh, so, all right, well, let's wrap it there. That is uh, it for us this week. Thanks for listening to the protocol podcast thanks to our producer michelle musso if you have any questions about any stories or comments please reach out to us at podcasts at coindesk.com subject line the protocol you can listen to us weekly on coindesk podcast network or wherever you get your podcasts also please subscribe to our weekly newsletter the protocol on coindesk.com thanks a lot